Strange Studies of Strange Stories. I am a watchdog. My name is Snuff. I live with my master Jack outside of London now. I like Soho very much at night with its smelly fogs and dark streets. It is silent then and we go for long walks. Jack is under a curse from long ago and must do much of his work at night to keep worse things from happening. I keep watch while he's about it. If someone comes, I howl. We are the keepers of several curses and our work is very important. I have to keep watch on the thing in the circle, the thing in the wardrobe and the thing in the steamer trunk, not to mention the things in the mirror. When they try to get out, I raise particular hell with them. They're afraid of me. I do not know what I would do if they all tried to get out at the same time. It is good exercise though, and I snarl a lot. I fetch things for Jack on occasion. His wand, his big knife with the old writing on the sides. I always know just when he needs them because it's my job to watch and to know. I like being a watchdog better than what I was before he summoned me and gave me this job. So this story is narrated by the dog of Jack the Ripper. (laughs) What the hell is going on? You are hearing the opening lines of A Night in the Lonesome October by Roger Zelazny. It's a novel of monstrous delight, and we are going to talk about it this month here on Strange Studies of Strange Stories. I'm Chad Pfeiffer. And I'm Chris Lackey. We are at strangestudies.com. This is our free episode for the month of October. If you want more of this good stuff, Mm -hmm. head on over to Patreon. Yeah, subscribe. Who was that reader I heard reading that reading? That reader was Jason Rainbird. He is an excellent chap and a fellow gamer and one of my few friends that I actually see in person. Wow. Uh, Whereas I only know Mr. Rainbird from great distances at crowded parties, from lurking (laughs) in shadows as he walks past. So carefree, so alive. Rainbird! (laughs) A lot of listeners have recommended this book. And who might argue? It would be a slap in the face to not cover this book, really. And not one of those hilarious face slaps you see in lowbrow movies or that you read about in slapstick novels. This would be one of those kind of shocking face slaps that makes the Pizza Hut go quiet. (laughs) So we're going to do it. It's been recommended lots. It has. Uh, Surprisingly, I wasn't really aware of it until recent years, even though it was published in 1993. So it's been around quite a while. When I did start hearing it, I was kind of turned off by the quick synopsis of it and even the book jacket because it's all of these different characters hanging around together. And that's so often not good Mm -hmm. when that happens in fiction, mixing characters from different properties, other than League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, which has a lot of cool stuff happening on its own. It's not just referency, whereas a lot of these things are kind of just pulpy, a little lazy in that they're referencing other works. But I guess I didn't realize this book was really humorous in tone. It wasn't until Hmm. we did the Gay and Wilson story last month and people were talking about that that I started to get it. Oh, it's humorous, not in a broad way, but kind of that precious and cutesy way. I don't mean those as negative things, but it's cute, but has this undercurrent of real malignancy in it. It's a tone I don't necessarily have a label for, but it's good natured. It's fun. It makes me feel like I'm hanging out with my buddies who also love monsters. That's like the feeling I get from this book. And that's the feeling you want. Yeah. Neil Gaiman writes in this tone a lot. I know that he was really influenced by Zelazny. And Zelazny is a big deal. Yeah. I don't know if you heard that, but I said big deal in all caps. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's how big of a deal he is. I usually speak in lowercase. Yeah. Kind of have an E.E. Cummings dialect. Mm -hmm. Speaking of literary jokes, let's hear about this Roger Zelazny. Why have I turned on him suddenly? He was born Robert Joseph Zelazny in the United States, specifically Euclid, Ohio, in 1937, child of a mixed marriage, a Polish immigrant dad, and an Irish American mom. As a teen, he was editor of his high school newspaper and involved in creative writing. He went to school at Columbia University in New York, where he studied Elizabethan and Jacobian drama. And those were his roommates, Elizabeth and Jacob. Guys, there's so much drama going on, I could get a degree. (laughs) In it. And that's not true. In the early 60s, he worked for Social Security Administration in Cleveland, then in Baltimore, but he was always writing fiction on the side and he was getting published. But by 1969, he was able to quit his day job and become a full-time writer. He did it. He made it. Yeah. Imagine how stifling it must have been to just be writing Social Security numbers all day. (laughs) Job like that. All they want are sequels. And that's when he got started into his most popular works, The Chronicles of Amber, with his first novel in 1970, The Princes in Amber. 
And speaking of multiverse hotness, which is Mm -hmm. where I think we were a few weeks ago. Yeah, all the extra dimensional stuff that's going on right now. Yeah. This has it in spades. Tons of extra dimensional. The the setting of the world is that there's this place called Amber, which is the only one true reality. And there's all of these infinite realities that are shadow versions of this place, this this place called Amber. Mm -hmm. And our Earth is one of the shadows. Oh. One of the main characters in in this first book think he has amnesia i haven't read it in 20 years but he has amnesia and discovers he's one of these true beings one of these this family that lives in amber Mm -hmm. and then he ends up going back and there's all this political intrigue that goes on there's all this crazy stuff you know you can have cyberpunk stuff you've got fantasy stuff you got because there's this entire huge multiverse and also in the 90s there was a role-playing game called the chronicles of amber that came out which was a big deal because it was one of the first diceless role-playing games there's no dice involved so you you just would look at your character's stats and compare them and whoever had the better stat would win mm. but then circumstances would change that you know it would it would give you kind of an edge if you know you had the higher ground so that you may right. be a, not as good a fighter as this guy but if you've got the higher ground and you've got a better weapon then you'll win the fight so it was that kind of thing oh man i could just see that descending into tons of no 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 <laughs> did you play the game i did yeah it was a really fun game and i mean it's influential in the role-playing game world i think everybody read it and it kind of led into that more storytelling narrative mm-hmm. role-playing game stuff. You oh, know, cool. It, it came out in 91, same year Vampire the Masquerade did. It's a really cool setting, and there's a lot to it. I know people love it. I think I played in a Dungeons & Dragons campaign that was based on this, but I never read the book, so I didn't really understand all the references. What prompted you to read the book quite a while ago? The role-playing game. Oh, so you did the game and then... I did the game and then I was like, you know, I should really check this out. And you read The Nine Princes in Amber? That's the first one. Yes, that's the first one. And then there was 10 novels in the whole series. And then there's also a bunch of short stories set in this multiverse with these characters. So the characters go into the different worlds and they're all different versions of the world they're from that have different genre elements and that kind of thing. Or are they completely different worlds? There can be completely different worlds. Okay. But the closer the closer you get to Amber, and that's an air quote, so I don't know if you can see that, yeah. the more like Amber it gets, the more real the world is, and they're less powerful. But like if you go out to weigh, weigh the F out where Earth is, where mm-hmm. our world is, they're very powerful. They can do kind of magic stuff. They have this thing called walking the pattern. That's when they are able to walk through different dimensions. So as they walk, the world changes around them. There's a lot of cool stuff in there. And that concept, I think, shows up in this story, oddly. The idea of walking a pattern and the power of symbols if you trace them on the ground. So, yeah, 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 yeah. okay, that's interesting. And his work is really heavily influenced by mythology and history. uh, But he was also super into fencing and martial arts. He studied judo, aikido, and a a few other martial arts. Hmm. But he was also really into smoking. Uh, he was like a, a smoking connoisseur, you know, one of mm-hmm. these people that gets the certain kind of tobacco and does all the stuff, but he quit it because he was so into martial arts and being a martial artist and his health was more important to him. I read that all of his characters were also heavy smokers yeah. until he quit and then they weren't anymore. And it's like you try to read, you try not to read too much of the author and what they write, but yeah. Zelazny's not helping by no. doing that. <laughs> no, but he died relatively young of kidney failure due to cancer in 1995 at the age of 58. Oh, man, that's young. Yeah. And getting younger by the minute. But he's won six Hugos, three Nebulas, two Locas, one pre-tour Apollo Award, and even more than that. Mm. He is a man to be reckoned with. I'm pulling this from The Literary Life of Roger Zelazny by Christopher S. Kovacs. In his stories, Zelazny frequently portrayed characters from myth, as you said, depicted in the modern or a future world. His crisp, minimalistic dialogue also seems to be somewhat influenced by the style of wisecracking, hard-boiled crime authors such as Raymond Chandler or Dashiell Hammett. The tension between the ancient and the modern, surreal and familiar, was what drove most of his work. A very frequent motif in Zelazny's work is immortality or people who who have become gods, as well as gods who have turned into people. The mythological traditions his fiction borrowed from include Chinese, Egyptian, Greek, Hindu, Navajo, Norse. He was into uh, psychoanalysis and Kabbalah. Mm-hmm. And uh, additionally, there are elements from Irish mythology, Arthurian legend, and even real history that appear in the Chronicles of Amber, as you were describing. Mm-hmm. A Night in the Lonesome October involves the Cthulhu mythos in a similar vein. There you go. This story, A Night in the Lonesome October, was published in 1993. So this is pretty new for us and was illustrated by the great Gay and Wilson 
This was his last book published before he died. One of his last news favorites, supposedly. And we just covered a story, as we said, by the illustrator Gan Wilson. His sketches in this book, they have a real primitive insanity to them, yeah. which may be the most art world thing I've ever said. But that, that's how <laughs> I would describe them. It's not just the Cthulhu mythos he's pulling from in this book, though. It's sort of the monster world that really existed in my mind before I'd really studied any of the source material yeah. because the characters are so strong. What this book really reminded me of the most was being a kid, seven or eight years Years old and playing monsters. Yeah. I would spend a lot of time in the summers around that age with my oldest sister and her son, my nephew, who's around my age. We hadn't seen any universal horror movies, maybe snippets on TV, but we wouldn't have had access to the actual movies at that time. But there were these books from the library on each of the monsters with tons of stills from the films. Mm -hmm. So we had those characters in our heads and we'd play out these elaborate backstories where Dracula was the mad scientist who created Frankenstein and then sure, yeah. they went out and they round they caught the wolf man King Kong maybe was involved somehow sure why not we definitely were mixing up a lot of potions the <laughs> oh, design yeah. and the concepts of those universal movie characters were so neat and it was one of the first cinematic universes they themselves put the characters together in movies like Frankenstein yeah. versus the wolf man sure. so I didn't even need to know their full stories yet to mix them up have some kind of a cult adventure and this book is a much more advanced and well done version of that kind of play. That's sort of what I felt like it was. It was it was a playground mm. of stuff that monster people love. Yeah. More than it was really a, a strong narrative. Yeah. And I did the same when I was a kid. I think we all did. And I remember it was movies like uh, Evan Costello Meet Frankenstein, which had mm -hmm. the Wolfman and Dracula and the monster. And then I think at the very end, the Invisible Man shows up too. And I loved that movie as a kid. I tried to rewatch it. And it, <laughs> it did not hold up. Yeah, it's weird. That is a tough one to. It's just tough. It's tough to get through for me too, which is yeah. I feel guilty. I don't know what it's about, but this captures my memory of that movie, not the yeah. actual movie itself. Yeah, where some of those Universal movies are dynamite still, but that later comedy stuff, ah, you like it because Bella's in there, and you yeah. know, but but they're kind of boring. They're not great. This novel is broken up into thirty-two chapters, each one representing a night in October and a preface, but bringing us to, I, I think, Halloween, I'm guessing, because I have yet to finish the book. It, well, it ends on day 31. So yeah, Halloween. I will cover about eight chapters in an episode. Some people were writing that they like to take this book out every October and read a chapter a day, like an advent calendar. But the chapters are so short and snappy, I think I'd have a hard time doing that. It's, it's hard to just read one. Um, one last thing before we jump in, the dedication at the start of the book is like a murderer's row of past authors from our podcast. Oh, it right, says, yeah. to Mary Shelley, Edgar Allan Poe, Bram Stoker, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, H.P. Lovecraft, Ray Bradbury, Robert Block, Albert Pace, and Turhune, and the makers of a lot of old movies, thanks. And I thought, what obscure horror genius is this Albert Pace and Turhune? Yeah, who's that? That I've never even heard of him. Hmm? Uh, looked him up. Albert Pace and Turhune was an American author, dog breeder, and journalist. He was popular for his novels relating the adventures of his beloved collies and as a breeder of collies at his Sunnybank uh, kennels, the lines of which still exist in today's rough collies. Got it. So this is a dude who wrote dog novels. <laughs> Probably popular on dog studies of dog stories, but that's why we haven't heard of him here. And uh, yeah, you will immediately see the relevance of uh, dog characters in this book. Let's get into yeah. it. So the prologue begins with our meeting, our narrator, Snuff the Dog. He is Jack the Ripper's familiar. Jack is not just a guy who brutally murdered five women, mm. Marianne Nichols, Annie Chapman, Elizabeth Stride, Catherine Eddowes, and Mary Jane Kelly in London in 1888. He's also some kind of wizard. I felt weird about that. How did it sit with you? I mean, I guess since it's so far in the past, I didn't care that much. I know what you're saying. Jack the Ripper is just a villain in so many pieces of pop entertainment. Yeah that I think it's more of the character of Jack the Ripper. Although part of me was thinking it would be funny to go really far in this direction and like go to the public library. Guys, you know that book Dracula? It's based on a real man. Vlad Dracula, he killed tens of thousands of people. <laughs> Can you remove it from the shelves, please? I mean, you know, how does this sit with you? Well, to make glorious somebody who is so evil. Well, because, well, Jack the Ripper was a real guy and yes. who's known because he's killed right, right, five women right. and wasn't caught, I think is probably why he's still famous. And there's a lot of mystery around him and a lot of mythologizing around him for some strange reason, but he's just a terrible person that killed five people. Yeah, but it's because he wasn't caught, like you say, so we can yeah. make stories up. But Dracula, 
Dracula is so loosely based off Vlad the Impaler. You know, like it, there's really no connection besides we know from what Bram Stoker has said about it. I, have you watched the beginning of Coppola's Dracula? <laughs> Connects them up like Legos. It's the same so, guy. So pretty loose connection. I know, but, I know what but, you're saying. But too. Jack the Ripper. But you know what I'm saying, right? He's kind I, of a character. Absolutely. Oh, dude. He is in everything, like time after time, where he yeah. time travels with H.G. Wells. Yep. The movie A Study in Terror, the original series Star Trek episode, <laughs> Wolf in the Fold, written by Robert Block, where the ghost of Jack the Ripper possesses Scotty, who kills a belly dancer. Oh, man. Yeah, that happened. Does Scotty remember having done that for the rest of his career? Well, he never brings it up again, but he blacks out when Jack the Ripper took over. But he, you know, he has blood on his hands and yeah. he's like, what happened? Oh, my God. And oh, man. They're able to figure out that Jack the Ripper, when he was murdering people, was this alien entity that came to Earth and was <laughs> murdering people for a while and then went off to another planet. It's ridiculous. Yeah. But also episodes that get smart. Cole Shack the Night Stalker had some Jack the Ripper. There's Fantasy Island had Jack the Ripper. Friday the yeah. 13th, the series. Even Babylon 5 had some Jack the Ripper in it. Whoa. And then in Amazon Women on the Moon, that movie, Jack the Ripper is the Loch Ness Monster. Yeah. <laughs> that was funny. Which was really funny. <laughs> I mean, Alan Moore's graphic novel, From Hell, paints a little bit more honest and unsettling de depiction of Jack the Ripper. Like, he d was this horrible person that did these horrible things to these poor women. But Jack yeah. the Ripper, I think it's because he wasn't caught that people make him out to be something more than just some scumbag. And there's a healthy amount of time. There's more than a century. And I think that, I mean, I went on the Jack the Ripper tour in London and went yeah. and had a drink at the Ten Bells. And it's just like, it's horrific what you're doing. You're having a little theme park attraction, the site of these terrible murders, but it's a tragedy plus time, I guess. I don't know. Mm. I would definitely be way more put off if this were David Berkowitz or something in the book. Yeah, You know, yeah. I watch true crime and TV shows that are about serial killers but I do sure. have a strong, like, I don't like it if they're just being glamorized. I, I prefer it if it has some sort of angle. Usually it does. Like, it's sociological. Mm -hmm. yeah. what, is, what does this person's crimes tell us about society? Or how do we care uh, for the least among us that these things mm -hmm. went uh, ignored because, you know, sex workers were uh, being predated upon or, or yeah. whatever, how police ignore this or that. Mm -hmm. Now, Berkowitz did blame a talking dog for his crimes, but I wouldn't want to see that depicted as a fun Halloween no. romp. No. Jack the Ripper, though, yeah, it, just, it doesn't sit that way because he's been fictionalized so much. Sure. And the way it's positioned here, there's some kind of supernatural reason behind his murders, as we heard Rainbird say. Jack is under a curse from long ago and must do much of his work at night to keep worse things from happening. So carefree, so alive, Rainbird. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, he's protecting us in some way by doing this. Maybe, yeah. yeah. I'm not sure yet in the story because I, I haven't finished. I'm only a little more than halfway through the book. Me too. Now, Snuff the Dog is helping Jack the Ripper collect things that he needs for what seems to be some kind of magical battle. In the prologue, Snuff is of human level intelligence. Supernatural, maybe, himself? But he can talk to other animals as well, like there's a watchdog in the cemetery with whom he's on good terms. We find that other people have been doing some grave robbing locally in this prologue. There's also a jokiness to this writing. Like Snuff asks the graveyard dog if he likes being a graveyard dog, and he goes, eh, it's a living. Maybe I was predisposed to like this because I was such a big fan of Benicula, as I've mentioned a lot of times <laughs> when I was young, and that had talking dog and cat and a vampire bunny in it, so I'm on sure. board. It also yeah. se it seems like Zelazny also shared our revelation that dogs are the heroes of the Cthulhu mythos. There you go. Because Snuff is wandering around barking down all the things and the whatnots that Jack has around the house yeah. and they're scared of him again by committing these awful murders Jack the Ripper is somehow saving us from all these Lovecraftian horrors and Snuff is a part of that endeavor pretty mm -hmm. on the nose name for a dog of Jack the Ripper Snuff um, oh god that's the setup for the book <laughs> didn't even, even kind of even connect that well because of the era you think about taking Snuff but yeah, there's yeah, also no, the no, other meaning yeah, of it the um, other one yeah let's get into the actual calendar October 1st uh, just a few days ago at Jack's place we find out that he has a lot of unspeakable things trapped in household objects there is one thing trapped in a magic circle that takes the form of various lady dogs to try and lure Snuff into breaking the lines but Snuff is not even tempted by these because they don't smell like a dog, so he's not attracted to them. They're probably like some kind of Thing-esque monstrosities, and I mean the movie The Thing. You oh, know, right, when, yes. it, when yeah, it's yeah. trying to be a dog, that's probably what it looks like, but with lipstick on. So <laughs> Snuff isn't into it. <laughs> we also have things trapped in mirrors and a steamer trunk and in a wardrobe. 
The one in the wardrobe is quite nice and has a very polite conversation with Snuff, trying to persuade him to let him out. But Snuff doesn't even entertain that idea either and doesn't really seem to be annoyed that the creature keeps trying to persuade him. He's like, you know, you're, he's going to do his thing. That's fine. I'm not going to let him out, but he could talk all he wants. It's chummy adversarial relationship kind of like between a, a prison guard and, and an inmate. The dog likes doing his job as a watchdog. These guys trying to manipulate their way out of the traps, that that's what keeps them in business. Yeah. I mean, you've been a security guard. You surely understand <laughs> how this works. <laughs> I sure do. <laughs> October 2nd is introduced by the illustration of a cat hiding in a tree. After collecting some mandrake root, Snuff overhears Jack having a, having good-natured banter with the thing in the circle. But outside, at the window, Grey Mulk the cat comes slinking around. Grey Mulk is the familiar to Crazy Jill, who I assume is a witch. Yeah, I think Crazy Jill is just a generic witch. Maybe one of the witches from Macbeth, if if there's a literary source. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because in the opening of that play, one of the three witches planning to meet with Macbeth says, I come, Grey Malkin, uh, responding to a summons from her cat, her cat familiar. Right. Shakespeare's Grey Malkin literally means Grey Cat. Mm. So I assume that that is, this is that cat. Ah, okay. Or named after that cat. Now, Steph goes outside to talk to her. They have a guarded conversation about what the other is up to, but they share information. She tells Snuff about Nightwind the Owl, who is a consort to Morris and Macab. In the story, they're referred to as hermetic occultists, but they seem to be modeled off real-life grave robbers Burke and Hare, or possibly it could be a reference to McGregor Mathers, who was an actual Victorian occultist. I think it might be a portmanteau of all those characters. I was hoping, speaking of Abbott and Costello, maybe that's who these characters were. They're, yeah. you know, slapstick characters. I think their names are puns on morose and macabre, mm-hmm. perhaps. Like Crazy Jill, they're more types than actual yeah. characters. Right. And then the name Nightwind for the owl, I think, comes from how sometimes at night there's wind. Yeah. <laughs> That works. <laughs> but one works of Nightwind's me. feathers was found by the cat outside of Snuff's place. It says, the feather is tainted with mummy dust to do you ill. Mm. And I was like, oh, first mistakes Lasney made here. Mummy dust isn't to do you ill. That's good for you. Doesn't he know the value of mummy tea? Oh, right. Yeah, little mummy for the tummy. Mm, <laughs> mummy tea. Imho tasty. She also mentions that she's seen Quicklime, the snake, who's a familiar to the mad monk, Rostov, who seems to be a stand-in for Rasputin. Rostov is also a Russian city, and the word means growth. Rasputin is also kind of the prototype for Jason Voorhees. You know, he can't be killed. No matter what you do to Rasputin, he comes back. (laughs) But he didn't kill anybody, did he, Rasputin? He wore a hockey mask. He seduced a lot of people. (laughs) No, yeah, he he was more of a a seducer and hypnotist mystic type who got into affairs to his own benefit, we think. Yeah, he did. They share information like kids trading baseball cards. All of these people are players in a game, but at this point, we're not sure what this game is that they're actually playing. Maybe it's Horrified, the board game. Oh, yeah. Have you played that? I played it lots, and I have it. Yeah. I'm going to play it this week because I'm. it's that time of year. It is that time of year to get Horrified out. I have it as well. I, I enjoy playing it. Glad we had this talk. Me too. Let's get into October 3rd. Snuff and Jack are out a lot getting things for this magical ritual, maybe, it seems, mm. or several magic rituals. We're not sure. It's not clear at this point in the story. Snuff goes out on his own and he checks on Rastov's place and then Crazy Jill's and he says that the broom outside her door was still warm. Snuff. It's a little inappropriate. <laughs> Snuff's Seat sniffing snuff. Oh, 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 no. What are you doing? (laughs) Stay away from that broom. A little bat called Needle finds snuff snooping around. They both explain who they are and who they work for. Needle the bat is a familiar to the Count. They exchange information they've gathered in a type of deal that they have. I tell you this and you tell me that kind of thing. Count, I think, is Count Dracula. Mm. Not the Count of Monte Cristo, as I originally thought, maybe. Oh, okay. Yeah. Really? You think it's Dracula? (laughs) Okay. (laughs) And the bat called Needle because he's into knitting, I can assume. That's why I go with that. Mm -hmm. We discover that Snuff doesn't know how many players are in the game. And that gets us to October 4th. While looking around the neighborhood, he discovers an old man harvesting mistletoe with a sickle. And this man has a little squirrel on his shoulder. Snuff clocks them both as players. Snuff directly asks the squirrel if he's in the game and introduces himself. And Cheater, the squirrel, introduces himself to Snuff. Snuff asks if he's an opener or a closer, but Cheater says, hey, that's not polite to ask. Owen Hmm. is Cheater's owner, and he might be a druid. Yeah, I I guess the players change every year, whatever this is that's going on. Mm -hmm. Mistletoe has all sorts of magical powers, so I think it is a druid. I'm getting this from an article about mistletoe that I read on the Hazel Tree 
website. Mm -hmm. It's almost impossible to talk about mistletoe without mentioning the Druids, and that is largely thanks to Pliny the Elder, a Roman naturalist and philosopher who described some curious ceremonies that took place in the Gallic provinces. The Druids, that is what they call their magicians, hold nothing more sacred than mistletoe. When it is discovered, it is gathered with great ceremony, and particularly on the sixth day of the moon, because it is then rising in strength and not one half of its full size. Hailing the moon in a native word that means healing all things, they prepare a ritual sacrifice and banquet beneath the tree and bring up two white bulls whose horns are bound for the first time on this occasion. A priest arrayed in white vestments climbs the tree and with a golden sickle cuts down the mistletoe, mm. which is caught in a white cloak. Then finally, they kill the victims, praying to God to render his gift propitious to those on whom he has bestowed it. They believe that mistletoe given in drink will impart fertility to any animal that is barren and that it is an antidote for all poisons. Mm. So yeah, I mean, since that's what he's doing when we first find him, I do think this guy's a generic druid. Yeah. Luckily, he doesn't have a white bull as a familiar because that could get quite sad. And he's not a D&D &D druid, so he's not going to turn into a owl bear or anything like that. <sighs> Too bad. I, I mean, I'm guessing. I, like I said, I haven't read the book yet, so maybe that happens. Cheater asks if there is a black snake in the game, and Snuff warns him to be careful. Rastov is mad. But Cheater replies... Aren't they all? Now we land on October 5th, the day that is traditionally associated with my birth. Yes. Thought it might be mentioned. Was not. But strangely. Snuff does his rounds in the house, making sure the things are still where they should be. Then he checks on Jill's place and then Rastov's, where he finds Grey Malk having a little catnap. Mm -hmm. They share a bit of information on what they've seen, and they decide to peek in on Rastov's place together, which seems empty. They then go over to Morris and McCabs and run into Nightwind, the owl. They ask Nightwind if he knows anything about the killing in town. There's been a murder. They trade information, and Nightwind reveals that a small hunched man has been seen robbing graves for the past few nights. He took the body parts to a farmhouse in the south of town, and he has delivered them to a man called the Good Doctor. Mm. So we've got our Frankenstein. The farmhouse has lots of lightning rods. And it seems there's a storm perpetually raging just above the farmhouse, which I thought was cool. Now, Snuff mentions it's hard keeping track of all these trails now that there are more players in the game. It seems that it's important where all these locations are laid out because they're mapping some kind of big symbol or something, and that's that concept that was present in the Chronicles of Amber, mm. walking symbols to lift some kind of veil, shift between dimensions, I guess they're going to, when they're talking about opening and closing things, mm -hmm. it must be some people want to open portals to some horrific Halloween world and some people want to close them, mm -hmm. maybe. Also, Snuff finds a giant paw print by the house and it's not his. So there's some kind of secondary mystery here. Whom does this paw belong to? Mm -hmm. And then on to the day traditionally known as you're not special anymore, Pfeiffer. Calm down day. <laughs> <laughs> October 6th. So in the morning, one of the mirrors cracks and Snuff runs to keep the slitherers inside. Jack uses his mundane wand and channels them into another mirror. It says transfer them all to another mirror, just like the Yellow Emperor. Mm -hmm. So what's that about? I, I mean, know. it's a King in Yellow reference, I guess, right? Could be, could be. Later, Snuff goes looking around to see what everyone else is up to. Maybe find some more players, but he runs into Nightwind the Owl again. They talk about drawing lines between the places where the players are living and how that is of some significance, and they're both trying to piece it all together. Snuff asks Nightwind to try and follow Needle, the bat, to figure out where... The Count is staying, and he agrees. You know, if the Dracula were played by Christopher Lee, then it would be simultaneously Count Dracula and Count Dooku. <laughs> Double counted. <laughs> have you thought of that? You haven't thought of that. I have not That's thought of that. literary analysis I'm trying to bring wow. to this. October 7th. Uh, in the foggy evening, Jack and Snuff pass by the great detective and his companion. So we've got Sherlock Holmes and Watson in here, I'm guessing. Jack and Snuff are out collecting materials that seem to be components, again, for the spell. If you've got Jack the Ripper, then you got to have Sherlock Holmes. But him showing up, it's like he's so good at what he does, it seems unfair to involve him in any kind of mystery. Yeah. Because he's just going to figure it out. I, are they heroes? Is Jack the Ripper a hero? I don't know. Like, are the closers the good guys? I don't know. I couldn't figure it out yet. You know, I think one of the things that you've said is, is making me feel better about the story. You know, because I don't like the idea of Jack the Ripper being like a guy that might be doing something good. But he's not Jack the Ripper. He's just called Jack. That's right. Yeah. He's just as generic. He's sort of like the generic type. He's a generic type. We've got the professor. We've got the good doctor. We've got, you know, like they're not the count. They're not actually being called who 
they're standing in for. They're they're removed from. So they're they're more like characters in a Castlevania Ghosts and Goblins kind of side scrolling exactly. Halloween adventure. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Where they're afraid they don't have the rights, so they just name everybody. It's it's yeah. Count Kukenstein and you know. Exactly, exactly. So I'm feeling a little bit less uncomfortable about the whole the whole Jack the Ripper thing. Good. Now, when they get back home, Snuff detects that something is in the house uh, by one of the mirrors. It's a rat, and Snuff catches it in his mouth. And the rat says, no, no, don't kill me, don't kill me. Uh, I, Snuff, I know your name. I was sent by Needle, the bat, and Cheater told me where to find you, so I'm part of the game. So he throws him in the corner to interrogate him. So you are in the game. The rat is called Bubo, and he works for the doctor. Shouldn't Bubo be an owl? Yeah. Not a rat? This is when the story really stretched credibility for me. <laughs> that was when I went, wait a minute. <laughs> this is not nonfiction. This book did come out after Clash of the Titans, just for the record. Yeah. That was on the table for Zelazne, and he did not pick it up. He should so. know not just from his reading of mythology, but also from Clash of the Titans. <laughs> This is a no-no. <laughs> he says that he has information to trade with him, the location of the Count's sleeping quarters. Bobo the Rat takes snuff to the remains of an old church, and the old church is on the ruins of something older. But Bubo says, no, 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 that's not where we're stopping. We're going to go further to the cemetery, to a crypt that's hiding among these weeds. Bubo points to a hole and says that's how he gets in. So back home around midnight, Snuff fills Jack in on what he's learned and explained that he's going to spend the rest of the night making calculations. Snuff. The dog is going to be making calculations. It's that natural math talent that <laughs> canines are known to have. We also find out here that he can not just talk to other animals, but to his owner. Yeah. With midnight's chimes, speech comes to me. I rose and stretched, waiting for them to cease. Jack, having roused himself, especially for the occasion, watched me with a mixture of amusement and interest. So when you say Snuff fills Jack in on what he learned, he, he does it through conversation. Yes. Yeah, they talk. It's not a mind reading thing. So after filling Jack in, Snuff asks, We're going out tonight. No, we're set for now. Have you any plans? Little calculation and a lot of rest. Sounds like a good idea. Do you remember that time in Dijon when that lady from the other side managed to distract you? It's hard to forget. Why do you ask? No special reason. Just reminiscing. Good night, Jack. I moved to my favourite corner and settled with my head upon my paws. Night stuff. I listened to his retreating footsteps. It's time to visit Growler for a workshop in advanced stalking. Soon the world went away. We don't know who Growler is, some kind of mentoring dog or wolf, mm -hmm. I guess, but we're going to have to find out in subsequent episodes because those are our eight chapters for this one. That's it. So this reference to the time in Dijon, it makes it seem like maybe they've played this game before and not won. Or they did win? I don't know. We don't know if they're yeah. the good guys or the bad guys. Opener and closer. So maybe there are people that want to keep the doors closed so that the Lovecraftian horrors can't get into our world and there's others that want to open it so yeah we're not sure yet it hasn't been revealed coffees for closers that's that character's <laughs> going to show up too the glenn gary glenn ross guys are going to show up in here pretty soon too <laughs> then it gets wild you get a car you get steak knives you get fired <laughs> set of steak knives so far i'm enjoying this like i said it's less of a literary journey and more of a just kind of fun goofing around thing and i'm cool with that yes. because you know this is this is the season and i love halloween and i'm happy to be doing yeah. it and it's especially nice for me this year because I haven't actually had a, a real autumn in like 25 years. The leaves are starting to change. Right? There's a chill in the air. You're I, in the Midwest? Yeah, Halloween's coming up and it feels really real. I always enjoyed my Halloweens in California, but this is pretty interesting to revisit this. So I'm extra Halloween spirited yeah. this year, if that's possible. So I'm glad that folks selected this. You know who else has got a great Halloween spirit? Who's that? Our reader, Jason Rainbird. So alive! <laughs> I can't wait to see him this month. I think every game session that we go to, he's going to be wearing a different Halloween themed outfit. Is that right? I'll keep you informed on what he's going to be wearing. I haven't seen him yet this week, but I'll let uh -huh. you know on the next episode. Oh, I'm excited. It's always exciting with Jason. You never know if you're, what you're going to get, except for a good reading. You do know you're going to get that. And that's what he delivered. Thank you, Jason. <laughs> that's all we have for this week. Thank you folks for tuning in. If you want to listen to all four parts of this, please go over to patreon.com slash witch house media and subscribe. We do yes. four shows on stories every month and then we've got a bonus episode and a comments episode it's a lot of fun just like the story over there so please tune in for now i'm chad pfeiffer i'm chris lackey and you've been listening to strange studies of strange stories at strangestudies.com and patreon strange studies of strange stories ah!